and get started. I want to welcome everybody to this um, weekly research seminar series of the Center of Excellence in Biodiversity and Natural Resource Management. And we are at the University of Rwanda in the College of Science and Technology. And we have this weekly seminar where we uh, love to hear about different research projects. They could be um, ones that have just started, ones that have finished, or ones that are still in progress. Um, and it's an opportunity to um, present and talk to other people in this great community of researchers and conservation practitioners from academia, government, and the private sector. So um, today we're, we're really happy to have um, a speaker here, um, Shannon McFarland. She's a professor at the Department of Anthropology in the George Washington University in the United States. And she's also with the Center for Advanced Study of Human Paleobiology. And Shannon's been working for a very long time in the Volcanoes National Park studying mountain gorillas. Um, and she's going to be talking to us about some of the research that she's been working on. And um, I understand that in this research, she partners closely with RDB, and of course, with the Diane Flossie Gorilla Fund International, with Gorilla Doctors, and with the, with the National Museums of Rwanda. And uh, we also hope maybe with the Center of Excellence in Biodiversity, um, we'd love to get partnership with you as well. And so with that, um, I thank everyone that's here already. And we'll just keep letting other people join. But I'm going to turn off my microphone and, and my video. I'm going to invite people to put comments in the chat. Um, if you have questions or comments for Shannon, we'll have some time at the end for a great discussion. So thanks everybody and welcome Shannon. Thank you so much, um, Beth uh, and, and Bennett for the very kind introduction and, and also for the invitation. Um, I've, I was saying earlier that I've, I've, I've heard so much about the COEB seminar series by my colleagues or from my colleagues um, there in Rwanda. Um, and I'm just really delighted to be here to participate today and also for the opportunity to to meet you and to and to hear your feedback so before i get started um sorry i'm just had a little technical glitch here uh oh it was working just fine a moment ago that's not good okay can you did you all see the slide advance yes um okay. it looks like you're on the side of contri core and contributing partners Yes, yes, thank okay. you. Okay, um, so before I begin, I just want to first point out that, um, as Dr. Kaplan said, I'm really here speaking on behalf of a large interdisciplinary collaboration, a team of researchers and veterinarians and national park staff from several organizations within and outside Rwanda, who've all worked very hard together to establish and maintain and build this project over time. And this project is a core partnership between the Rwanda Development Board, the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International, the Gorilla Doctors, the Institute of National Museums of Rwanda, and my institution at George Washington University. In addition, other institutions shown here have also been especially instrumental in supporting the project at different stages. Um, they've made very important contributions along the way. And finally, before I go on, I just want to acknowledge and thank the many individuals that are not represented on this slide, individuals from our partner organizations and also from other institutions in Rwanda and elsewhere who've made this project possible and also made it a lot of fun along the way. So in addition to many of the senior scientists and conservationists from these organizations, this larger group of people represent students and early postgraduates, veterinarians and conservationists at all stages, um, some of which you'll see sort of sprinkled throughout this talk. So this project focuses on mountain gorillas, uh, which as you know, more than anyone probably, uh, represent one of two recognized subspecies of Eastern gorilla found today in two geographically discontinuous subpopulations, one in the Bwindi Impenetrable, Impenetrable National Park in Uganda and Saramwe Na Nature Reserve in DR, DR Congo. And the second is found about 25 kilometers to the south inhabiting the volcanic slopes of the Virunga Massif. And it's work on the Virunga mountain gorillas that I'll discuss today, um, which are found in this protected area habitat that, that straddles this, the transboundary region between Rwanda and DR Congo and Uganda. And specifically, our work is focused on the Rwandan side of the border in Volcanoes National Park. Um, 
And, and as you know, Mountain Grill is here been the focus of daily monitoring and research on a nearly continuous basis since the late 1960s through the joint efforts of RDB, the Fosse Fund, Gorilla Doctors, and in coordination and partnership with IGCP and other organizations. And as a result of that regular monitoring of recognized individual gorillas from their births to their deaths over these roughly five and a half decades, we've learned a huge amount of information about the behavior and ecology of Lunga Mountain gorillas. And also, as data have also accumulated more recently across other great ape study sites, we're now recognizing more variability in features like diet and ecology and social behavior and life history among great apes than previously understood. The Virunga mountain gorillas are often described to represent an ecological extreme amongst great apes. They occupy the highest elevation habitats. Fruit is noticeably scarce in many habitat areas within the Virunga, so they're the least frugivorous and the most terrestrial in their um, substrate preference. They also have comparatively fast life history, so they reach important milestones of growth and development at earlier ages than other great apes, something I'll return to later in my talk. So given these differences, Virunga gorillas are an interesting group to study to understand the role of local ecology in shaping really fundamental aspects of great ape behavior and biology over evolutionary as well as more recent timeframes. But we're also of course interested in Virunga gorillas given their conservation importance. Mountain gorilla population size has increased in recent decades as you can see in this figure on the left here due to the effective conservation measures implemented by the governments of Rwanda and DR Congo and Uganda and their partners. However, while their population numbers continue to grow, they still remain under significant threat of extinction due to their restricted geographic range and the continued threats posed by human disturbance, disease, um, indirect poaching, habitat degradation, as well as the anticipated impacts of climate change. So, it remains a, a priority to continue to learn as much as we can about these individuals, particularly where this information can inform or support conservation strategies. So to this end, in 2007, we were asked by the Rwanda National Parks Authority and specifically by its chief veterinarian at the time, Dr. Tony Mutikikwa, to initiate an effort to assist Rwanda National Parks, which is now the Rwanda Development Board or RDB, in the recovery and preservation of skeletons from recently deceased mountain gorillas in the park and build capacity for their long-term management as a scientific and educational resource in Rwanda. The scientific motivation for this project was so that these skeletons could be studied to generate important but really fundamental data on the physical growth and development and aging of mountain gorillas as well as to improve knowledge of their health status. There was already at the time a history of recovering skeletons of mountain gorillas for study in Volcanoes National Park. Diane Fossey, who'd initiated long-term studies of this population decades earlier, recognized the value of recovering skeletons of the gorillas she studied for what we could continue to learn from them after their deaths. And so she began burying the, the remains of gorillas after they died in a small graveyard at the original site of the Karasuki Research Center in the park. And a number of those skeletons, and she later actually excavated or removed and sent to the Smithsonian Museum in the United States for study. Other studies remained at, or sorry, other skeletons remained at Karasoki and are part of the collection that I'll tell you about today. After Fossey's death, the Rwanda National Park Service and gorilla veterinarians continued this practice of burying gorillas when they were found in the forest and after conducting their standard post-mortem examinations. But as the protocols changed over time for a variety of reasons, gorillas were more commonly buried at different locations inside the park or even outside the park at National Park's headquarters. So it was Dr. Mutakikwa, who you see again here, who worked with staff to record the locations of these mountain gorilla burials so their skeletons could eventually be recovered. So in the first few years of the project, this required working with um, staff from all of our partner organizations to locate existing burials that accumulated since the late 1990s. And then once we located them, we worked to excavate or remove the skeletons following standard protocols and carefully sift through the soil to make sure we didn't lose any small bones during the process. Those skeletons were then brought back to the laboratory for cleaning, photographing, documentation, and cataloging. And we also collected these really detailed skeletal part inventories for all individuals, so we know what elements are, are available for study. 
One priority early on was developing more systematic protocols for the burial of any new mountain gorillas following necropsy and putting a reporting system in place, which you see here, to minimize information loss over time. So this included designating a burial site outside the park at RDB headquarters in Kinnicky, as well as um, other practices that we put into place. This just shows a couple of examples of skeletal preservation. The collection on the left is a young infant skeleton. And you can see here the tiny unfused bones of the upper and lower limbs, as well as the hands and feet. And on the right, um, another upper jaw, this time of, of a five month old infant, where you can see still some of the tiny developing tooth crowns that are still present within the jaw. So the preservation is quite good in the collection. And as an outcome of all of these efforts, Rwanda now has the largest collection of Mount Girl skeletal remains in the world, currently representing about 160 individuals. And the collection also includes skeletons of golden monkeys and other mammal and bird species from the park. And about 60% of the collection represents individuals of confirmed identity with, so they have associated demographic data, behavioral and veterinary records, either from RDB or Karasoki monitor groups. So that's a, a pretty extraordinary percentage of individuals with really detailed um, documented records. So this collection is really unique and exceptional um, given those characteristics and therefore it's attracted a lot of attention um, for its unique scientific value. The collection was just recently moved to a new laboratory space at the Ellen DeGeneres campus of the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund where it's managed under the ownership authority of RDB. This new lab provides a really stable, nice climate controlled environment where the collection can be conserved and managed and, while there's, and where there's now ample space for students and researchers to come and use the collection. We're still in the process of setting it up. So you still see some boxes and things around, but hopefully in June, we can get the rest of those boxes unpacked. And in fact, an important focus of our efforts with RDB and other partners along the way has been to build expertise to support the long-term preservation and management of the collection as a scientific and educational resource in Rwanda and to maximize the capacity of the collection itself to be used by students and scientists in Rwanda to continue to generate new knowledge on topics related to mountain gorilla biology. So in addition to establishing those protocols I mentioned earlier, we've also engaged with staff from our partner institutions, as well as with students from institutions both in Rwanda and abroad at all stages of this work, including many students from University of Rwanda. And we, we've done this, for example, through formal and informal internships and short courses that we've taught on aspects of skeletal biology and field methods, um, and through our partnership with Fossey Fund and RDB, um, we've been able to um, also use this collection as a resource for students undertaking their mentored um, senior memoir projects through the University of Rwanda Senior Memoir Program. So I show you just a few examples here of research topics that were undertaken in the memoir program. Um, I'll mention one or two of these um, in a few minutes in more detail. So what have we learned from studies of the collection so far? So I'm gonna to try to give a broad overview of a couple of areas, main avenues of research. First, um, as we recovered the earliest skeletons, one of the first things that really jumped out at us was the evidence of past injuries, disease, and aging related changes that impacted these individuals in life and then left their marks on the bones and teeth. So we know from all the veterinary monitoring that trauma or injury is a leading cause of death for mountain gorillas. And in fact, evidence of trauma is prevalent in the skeletal collection as well. In those early skeletons that we recovered, about 50% of them showed evidence of healed fractures or bones that had been broken and then healed during life. Some of these were due to accidents. Other reflected aggressive interactions between gorillas. So just to show you one example here, um, this is Titus, um, a dominant silverback gorilla from one of the Karasuki monitored research groups. Titus sustained a bite wound in his forearm just above the wrist during an interaction with his son, Umashiki Rano, shortly before his death. And here, what we can see in one of the bones of the forearm is a complete fracture through the bone marked at each end by a puncture hole, which was, we think, left by Rano's teeth as well as other signs of excess bone formation and indicating an infection. The largest frequency of skeletal fractures were observed in the hands and feet, however, and some of these fractures are associated with documented or suspected snare injuries, which then resulted in the near or partial amputation or loss of whole or part of the hand or foot. 
That's the case shown here in an adult female Pandora, who was one of the earliest and also the oldest gorillas to be observed and monitored for research. Pandora died in 2003, but over the course of her life, she was caught in multiple snares that had been set for other animals in the park, which then resulted in the loss of most of her right hand and part of one finger in her left hand. Now, as the skeleton, has, as the collection has grown over time, this has given us an opportunity to study whether there have been changes in the occurrence of these types of injuries over time as well. And this was the focus of a really neat, uh, interesting senior memoir study by a former University of Rwanda student, Gilbert Datimana. And he found um, that these hand and foot amputation injuries impacted about 16% of the 49 adult individuals he examined. And when he analyzed those individuals in the collection by their decades of birth, which is what you see here, he found that the frequency of those amputation injuries decreased over time for about 50% of the individuals he observed in the night who were born in the 1960s to no individuals that were born in the early 2000s. And interestingly, it was only these amputation injuries that showed this decrease over time. Other types of injuries didn't show that variation. So we have plans um, uh, to add new individuals to the sample with Gilbert to determine if this pattern holds up um, with, with a larger sample size. But if so, he suggested that this decreasing frequency of hand and foot amputation injuries may reflect intensification of conservation strategies, particularly increased anti-poaching and snare removal efforts compared to earlier periods in the park. These skeletons are also providing information about other aspects of gorilla health that may be more difficult to observe or assess during life. So for example, many older individuals in the collection showed degenerative or arthritic changes that are very similar to what we see in humans. These changes result from degradation of the cartilage in the joint between two bones, and then that exposes the bone surfaces within the joints and they begin to rub past each other. And over time that leads to wearing down of the bone surfaces and pitting of the surface as those bones come into contact. And then the body responds by trying to repair those lesions through the addition of new bone um, around the joint. And in extreme cases, in humans at least, this um, leads to reported experiences of joint pain, swelling, tenderness, stiffness, um, so I'll show you a few examples of this here um, from some of the more commonly affected areas in the gorillas. One is the spine. And so in this example, you can see this sort of dripping um, candle wax like effect. Um, I, I can't think of any better way to describe how it looks. Um, this is excess bone formation kind of dripping down or forming down the vertebrae of the lower back leading to their eventual fusion. And this is in a female gorilla named Papoose, also quite old, um, estimated 43 years of age when she died. And this is a bone in the elbow joint where hopefully you can see the little pits or holes in the surface of that, of that joint surface um, from a silverback male Bequi, who was actually quite young or younger than Pandora at least. He was estimated to be about 18 and a half when he died. So these changes might be idiopathic or they might be associated with certain risk factors. Um, but in one recent study by a former PhD student from the University of Sheffield, Laura Bajas Sotos, um, she showed that the severity of those changes in the Virunga gorillas increased with age, as is also the case in humans. So this suggests that to some extent, these are a very typical aspect of mountain gorilla aging. But we also see individual outliers or individuals that don't appear to show, or that appear to show more severity than is typical for their age. And these are often cases that are associated with past injuries. So this is another example. This is Umashiki Rano. Um, 22 years of age at death, where we see substantial degeneration and excess bone formation um, around um, a, a fracture that impacted the vertebral bones in the lower part of the neck and the upper part of the thorax. Interestingly, um, when I've talked to researchers who knew Rano in life, um, they've indicated that they weren't aware of such an injury. Um, so this suggests that maybe it, it might have been an injury that occurred during his years as a lone male when he wasn't being monitored as frequently by field staff, but we do see evidence of it in the skeletons. We also see indications of other health-related cha changes impacting the mouth or the oral cavity and the dentition. So for example, evidence of dental infections or abscesses, we see these in quite a few individuals in the collection. One common change, um, 
is erosion of the bone around the tooth sockets in the jaw. So this is a, an inset or a, a subset of the upper jaw, as you can see here, in three different individuals of different ages. Here's the canine teeth in the front of the mouth, and this would be the back of the mouth over here. Um, and you can see that the bone has sort of been eroded away, exposing the roots of these teeth as they hold or anchor the teeth in the jaw. And we can measure the height of this bone exposure or bone resorption as a measure or an indicator of severity of these changes. And we know that these changes have been associated in more and better studied contexts with inflammation of the gum tissue or the periodontium. And this happens when bacteria um, infect the gums and lead to the formation of deep pockets around the tooth. And then the supporting gum tissue and alveolar bone is eventually resorbed away. You can also see this on x-ray here. And when it leads to inflammation and eventual tooth loss, which it often, which it may at severe stages, this can then negatively impact an individual's ability to feed and thus gain adequate nutrition. So this problem was investigated recently by um, another researcher, Tade Muhire, a researcher at Fossey Fund. And he found that the severity of these changes is also positively correlated with age, as I showed you for the osteoarthritic changes. But there's, again, interesting inter-individual variation that doesn't appear to be associated with age. And the most extreme case in this sample was a young silverback male gorilla named Indatwa, who was just 15 years old when he died. And here we can see um, extensive bone resorption around the molar tooth roots or towards the back of the mouth and the lower jaw, which appears to have contributed to the complete loss of, of teeth on both the left and right sides of the jaw. So here again, there were no gross observations of periodontal disease recorded in the associated veterinary records of this individual. Um, and its cause of death was classified as gastrointestinal or infectious in nature based on other clinical findings. But this does help at least to provide a more complete picture of overall health in the latter stages of his life. So just to briefly summarize from this first set of studies or observations, you know, I just, I wanna argue that the skeletal collection really has a lot of potential to reveal evidence of threats facing mountain gorillas, including snare injuries and their potential changes over time, as well as, well as other aspects of mountain gorilla health and aging that are not so easily observed during life. So to follow up on these observations, um, we'd really like to continue some ongoing studies as well as future planned studies, which include working with, continuing to work with gorilla doctors and REB to understand to what extent these skeletal changes may co-occur with other indicators of morbidity or health assessed skeletally or through veterinary monitoring. So for example, we know that advanced gum disease is, has been associated with other complications, cardiovascular complications, rheumatoid arthritis, and other health conditions in humans. So it would be interesting to look at this in gorillas and particularly focusing on those outliers that I mentioned. Also, um, we'd like to better understand whether these underlying changes are associated with or might have impacts on the behavior of the gorillas in the field, impacts on their mobility or their movement or on their feeding behavior, for example. And then finally, as more samples accumulate, both from the Virungas as well as from other populations, um, hopefully we can gain a better understanding of whether there might be variation in indicators of skeletal health and aging between gorilla populations. So a second major focus of our research has been on mountain gorilla growth and development, and that's because Virunga gorillas are distinct from other great apes in several traits related to their life history or generally it's sort of their overall life cycle, the timing of their behavioral and reproductive maturation over time. Instead of taking more time to reach maturity, given their larger body size, Virunga gorillas are instead characterized by earlier ages at key maturational life um, milestones like age at weaning. They wean on average about one to two years earlier than, than other great apes. They have shorter intervals between births, um, earlier ages at reproductive maturation or first birth particularly, and thus higher fertility compared to most other great ape populations. And in fact, this fat, relatively fast life history of Virunga gorilla is maybe one factor in their ability to increase in population size, such as what we're seeing now, um, when conditions improve as they have. I just wanna note quickly that similar differences are also observed between gorilla populations as Virunga gorillas are characterized by faster developmental schedules compared to Western gorillas. And in some respects compared to those Buendi mountain gorillas as well. And researchers have suggested that 
this earlier or faster growth and development in mountain gorillas compared to other apes may be related to their reliance on this terrestrial herbaceous vegetation that is high in protein, so very nutritious and abundant year round. So Virunga gorillas may not be subject to the same kinds of other species. So if the same factors that govern aspects of behavioral and reproductive maturation also govern other aspects of development, we expect that Virunga gorillas should also reach measures of body size development or tooth development at comparatively early ages as well. But despite all we know about the behavioral ecology of gorillas and apes more generally, we actually have known surprisingly little about aspects of their physical or body size growth and development in natural environments. And in fact, instead, we've had to rely on developmental standards that are based on captive gorillas or on chimpanzees. So I wanna to talk to you about some of the studies we've done of teeth. Um, first, why, do, why are teeth interesting um, in this respect? Well, the dentition um, or the collection of teeth that we have in our mouths, this is a really important anatomical toolkit, essentially, that we use to process adult foods. So it's reasonable to expect that the development of the dentition should be very tightly linked to the maturation of other behavioral and physiological systems. And in fact, key milestones of dental development, namely the age at which these different teeth erupt through the gum tissue into the mouth is highly correlated with other important developmental milestones across a broad range of primate species. So one relationship of particular interest is the age of eruption of the first permanent tooth that we're gonna carry with us into adulthood. So this is the first molar tooth that would be located towards the very back of this youngster's mouth here. And age at first molar eruption is correlated with, and in fact occurs at about the same time as age at weaning across species. In mountain gorillas um, and in skeletons particularly, we can study this quite easily actually because their teeth take on this sort of black stain as they emerge through the gum tissue. And this stain gets darker as it comes into contact with solid food. And this dark staining is the criterion then that we can to recognize tooth eruption through the gums in specimens. So just a couple of examples, you can see an infant in Zozi who died at just over 1.2 years of age. This infant was in the process of erupting its first baby canine, so not the permanent canine, but the first wave of teeth that erupt in the mouth in infants. And we can see that in the, in the upper jaw here, just two different vantage points. And then an older infant, Vuyakure, um, who died at just over three years of age, was in the process of erupting her first permanent molar. So that's that first permanent molar tooth I just mentioned. Um, we can see that this tooth was just starting to poke through the gums um, based on the dark staining that is covering some, but not all of that tooth surface yet. So it wasn't yet fully erupted. So um, I'm showing you research that was initiated by another student, um, this time from our institution here at, at George Washington University, in which we collected these um, kinds of observations across the sample and plotted them all together. And this figure shown here, it looks a little bit complicated, but I'll walk, let's walk through it together. So here, age is along the horizontal axis on the bottom and different tooth positions. So the first molar, the incisors in the front of the mouth, and then later erupting molars are represented down this vertical axis. Um, starting at the top with those teeth that erupt first at younger ages and the bottom are those teeth that erupt at older ages. Open circles represent individuals whose tooth had not yet erupted by the time and age of their death. Um, solid triangles represent individuals whose tooth had fully erupted by the time and age of their death. And in some cases, teeth were observed to be in the process of eruption when they died, represented here by these little orange diamonds. When that wasn't the case, we assumed that eruption occurred essentially at the midpoint between these open and closed symbols. So the date at which the tooth was last observed to be absent and the date at which it was first observed to be erupted. So this sample is still quite small and it's opportunistic. It's based on natural deaths in the population. And so it's limited in that respect, but I'll just highlight some general findings um, that come to light. First, all individuals aged 10.7 years and older in the collection have completely erupted permanent dentition. So that appears to be the age at which they have all of their teeth in place. 
Second, um, we can then add onto this plot data from captive chimpanzees. So this is the only available reference standard for apes based on reasonably large samples. And here are data from several studies of captive chimpanzees. Um, the black lines represent the minimum, the mean or average and maximum ages at tooth emergence for those tooth positions for captive chimps. And what you can see is that the timing of tooth eruption in the Virunga gorillas represented in red overlaps almost entirely with the age ranges of captive chimpanzees at equivalence for equivalent teeth. So they're very similar. We can then add in a few of the wild, or the wild chimpanzee individual data points that are now accumulating from other study sites. Um, and those are represented in red and blue or green here. And what we can see is those wild chimpanzees also show very similar ages at first permanent molar eruption. They overlap with captive chimps and they overlap with the Virunga gorilla data points that we have. But as they get older to later stages of tooth development, some individual wild chimpanzees show delays in the age of eruption of those later developing teeth compared to both Virunga gorillas and the captive chimps. This might reflect impacts of nutrition or health or energetics in their natural environments. Um, but the timing, the sort of overarching pattern that we see here is that the timing of tooth eruption in mountain gorillas, the Virunga mountain gorillas, appears to be more similar to captive chimpanzees, in some cases erupting their teeth um, at earlier stages than, than wild chimpanzees, which is kind of interesting. We can then use x-ray imaging to examine tooth development in more detail, specifically to assess the different stages of tooth formation, which first starts with the formation of the, the tooth crown that's actually going to be that part of the tooth that's, that's in the oral cavity and that, that is involved in processing food. And then eventually that development kind of proceeds down the root. And these are different recognized stages of tooth development that you can see here. This is a study that um, was also um, done in large part by, by two um, additional students from the United States, um, Alexandra Kralik and Lauren Burgess. And this is just showing you one example from an infant, Ihu Murray, who was 3.7 years of age when um, she, uh, he died. And what you can see here is the first permanent molar had already erupted into the oral cavity and actually had all of its crown formed and about two thirds of its root form. The root is gonna to continue to elongate down into the jaw. The second molar though, behind that first molar was still developing inside the jaw. It was still developing its crown and it hadn't yet um, started to develop any of its roots. So it's at a, an earlier stage of development than the M1. And that makes sense because it erupts later. So in this study, we examined the development of the first, the second and the third molars and 43 mountain gorillas um, aged zero to 15 years. And for each individual of age Y, so on a vertical axis, we plotted the stage of tooth crown and root development for each of the first, second, and third molar. So the individual mountain gorilla data points are shown in green diamonds. And then here again, we plotted the captive chimpanzee standards for molar tooth development, which is what you see represented by the black and white boxes on this plot, very similar to the earlier that I showed you. So a couple of important observations. First, um, again, compared to captive chimpanzees, Virunga mountain gorillas show actually a lot of overlap, a lot of similarity, especially for the earliest stages of that first permanent molar development coinciding with crown formation. But for later stages of tooth development, which is what you see to the right of each of these plots, mountain gorillas reach those stages at comparatively older ages than captive chimpanzees. So while early development of the first molar appears conserved in mountain gorillas, later stages of molar tooth development are extended or delayed in Virunga gorillas compared to captive chimpanzees. So why might this be? Um, well, tooth size is probably a factor because mountain gorilla teeth are about 50% larger. They're bigger on average compared to chimpanzee teeth. So if it takes longer to form a larger tooth, then it's reasonable that gorillas are gonna be older at equivalent stages of tooth formation. But it's interesting that this is not the case for the development of that first molar crown. And we think this might be because mountain gorillas tend to wean their infants at comparatively much younger ages than chimpanzees um, in, in natural habitats at least. And so this might reflect a priority placed on, on development of that first permanent molar, especially early on, so that individuals can have a functional first molar in the mouth in time to process fibrous foods when offspring reach nutritional independence. 
the work I've discussed thus far really highlights, I think, the importance of having developmental and aging standards that are specific to Virunga mountain gorillas rather than relying on standards derived from other species or contexts like captive chimpanzees. And I also want to point out that these aging standards have really important practical utility. So because features like dental maturity status, um, that's what I'm showing again here, it's just represented a little bit differently as a composite score here. Um, because these vary predictably with age, once we've determined that relationship in known aged individuals, we can then use those measures to estimate the age of unknown or unhabituated members of the population. Also, as we establish population standards like this, we can then, or this then allows us to identify those individuals that fall outside of those predictions. And so these two individuals represent an example of such a case. Um, they were two infants, both males, that were born into the same social group, Dumbara's group, within two weeks of one another, in fact. They often happened to die around the same time. Um, Isange was a victim of infanticide, and Dengara was described to have been generally unwell for some time, smaller than other individuals his age, and he ultimately died of causes that um, have not yet been determined. And in fact, if we knew nothing about these two individuals, we would estimate that Dengara was potentially some six months younger than Isange, whereas in fact, Dengara was actually slightly older. So as we begin to see cases like this in the collection, this raised still more interesting questions for us, such as what factors influence variation in growth, such that one individual would be so much smaller than another individual of the same age? And are these differences in body size and dental maturity related in some way to health status or potentially to other outcomes later in life? So there are a couple of different ways we can approach those questions. One is to examine other skeletal markers of stress that reveal disturbances to normal development, um, specifically to try to understand the possible effects of stress on mountain gorilla growth biology. And so this is one um, particular study that was done by a former GW student, Kate McGrath, who examined linear enamel hypoplasias in the canine teeth. So these represent localized um, deficiencies in the thickness of the tooth crown that show up as these horizontal furrows or bands running around the tooth. They're superimposed on normal growth layers in the teeth because teeth grow a little kind of like trees, actually. And I'm happy to talk about that more if you're interested. Um, and those normal growth lines are the smaller lines that you see here in a higher magnification view. But these hypoplastic defects appear as more pronounced exaggerations of those furrows, which are significantly deeper in profile view. So if you were to take a transect down the surface of this tooth and then view it as a depth map or a topographic map, you can clearly see that defect as, as, as a feature that is significantly deeper than the surrounding structures. From epidemiological and experimental studies in humans and other species, these defects are known to form during periods of nutritional stress, um, childhood illness and fevers, increased parasitism, even periods of increased or severe social stress. And within species, variation in the depth of these defects is understood to reflect variation in the severity of the stressor. So either its magnitude or its duration. Although this is a phenomenon that still is not fully understood. We need to know a lot more about it. So this is very much work that's still ongoing. We're currently looking at inter-individual differences in these defects. But one interesting broader finding that's emerged from this work thus far is that mountain gorillas in the skeletal collection, most of whom died in the late 1990s to the current day, tend to have shallower defects than mountain gorillas recovered in the 1960s and 70s by Fossey and represented today in the Smithsonian collection. This warrants a lot more study, but for now it seems to provide some suggestive evidence that mountain gorillas have experienced changes in stress experienced during development over time, earlier versus more recent decades um, in the park. These particular data suggest, would appear to suggest that there have been reductions in developmental stress experienced over time. Um, but I think this is probably a more complicated story that I'm happy to talk about more. Given our time, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go past this, this this recent study that I just <laughs> flipped through, but I'm happy to come back to it if anybody has questions. And I just wanna talk about one sort of last research direction that was really prompted by research on the skeletal collection. And that's because one big challenge from studies of this kind, particularly when studying 
the biology of growth and development, relying on opportunistic, naturally accumulated skeletons, is that is that the the observations that we're making may be biased by mortality, because if we're interested in studying growth and development, these observations are comprised of immature gorillas who themselves died at early ages, potentially due to poor health or other factors like infanticide. So we don't really know whether these individuals in the collection are truly representative of living, healthy, surviving members of their populations. So to assess this and to better understand variability that we're seeing in the skeletal collection, this then led us to initiate new studies using non-invasive methods to collect data on body size, dental, and other aspects of physical development in the living gorillas within the park. So you can see um, Nadia Mionize here collecting body size data using this new technique. We used a method called photogrammetry um, and adapted it to the field setting, working with another researcher, a postdoctoral scientist, Jordi Galbany. This required a digital camera and a lens, which we then affixed to a base and a custom made apparatus that contained two sets of these parallel green lasers, kind of like laser pointers that we might use in a classroom. These laser pointers are separated by a known distance at their origin, four centimeters. And when they project parallel onto a target object, such as a gorilla here, so you can see the pointers here, the distance between the lasers at their origin should be the same as the distance on the target object. So since we know that distance, we can then essentially use this as a scale to calibrate measurements of the gorillas that we take from photographs. So we've done this um, measuring a variety of different body dimensions that you see here, as well as head dimensions. And I wanna call attention to body length here, which is from the shoulder to the rump. And our first aim was to characterize body size growth in the research study groups within Volcanoes National Park, really is a first step towards establishing better, more accurate growth standards for the population, body size growth standards for the population. So this, this shows a cross-sectional data set. So on the left, you see growth in size over age. Um, and on the right, what you see here is changes in rates of growth. So this is growth rate over time or, or age here based on 115 individuals in this initial sample. And I'm showing you results from body length, as I mentioned. And just a few basic observations. What you can see is that male and female gorilla curves overlap during the first seven years of life or so. And after that time, female growth rates really can um, uh, decline substantially and they females reach adult body length around 12 years of age, whereas male growth rates actually experience this little spurt or this slight increase from about seven to nine years of age. And then males reach maximum body size at about 14 to 15 years of age in this study. Interestingly, age and adult size in these Garunga gorillas, based on this initial analysis, is about three years younger or earlier than what has been reported for Western gorillas, but this is a finding that we're following up in further studies now. As longitudinal data are now accumulating from the same individuals over time, we can start now to look at individual growth trajectories across members of the population. And this too is revealing a lot of interesting variation that we haven't yet analyzed. I just, I love looking at this plot though. There's a lot going on here. Um, and just to go back to that first example, I showed you those two individuals. Here they are in their natal social group, Tambara's group, some point before their deaths. And you can see here that Dengera was smaller than Asange, despite, you can kind of appreciate that from this photograph, despite being nearly two weeks older. And we had actually started this photogrammetry project before these two gorillas unfortunately died. And so we're able to look back to understand a little bit more about their growth in life. And what we can see is that Dengera was smaller from the very first few months of life. And that those size differences remained as a result of Dengera continuing to grow at slower rates before, before death. We don't yet have a complete understanding of those two individuals and we may never because we only have a few data points for them but we can begin by investigating further the larger data set to start to isolate possible factors such as those that you see here that might influence the variations in growth that we see reflected in, in these data. And this project involves a number of different people, as you can see here, um, in addition to our larger partnership. And it's in fact our next step in this research. So just to summarize what, what we've learned thus far about mountain gorillas sort of skeletal growth biology, um, Virunga gorillas show a unique pattern of development across these different body systems compared to other apes, which 
appears to be linked with other life history characteristics, such as their early meaning. And this, I think, really highlights the importance of establishing population specific growth standards as tools for demographic and health monitoring. Finally, individuals show considerable variation in developmental rates and timing, and the sources and longer term outcomes of this variation, including how they relate to other trajectories of behavioral or physiological development, such as dietary development, which is the focus of another ongoing study um, by a student here at GW. Um, these are all um, studies that we plan to pursue in the future. To conclude, just a few major or broader points, um, I hope that we've convinced you that collections like this provide a really important, exciting opportunities to partner behavioral and ecological and health data collected from Virunga gorillas in life with information that we can recover retrospectively from their naturally accumulated skeletons after death. This work can lead to new insights, um, information that complements ongoing research and monitoring efforts, um, allowing us to kind of arrive at a more comprehensive understanding of aspects of gorilla biology that may be relevant to their evolution and their conservation. This work also generates new lines of research. I mentioned photogrammetry as one, but we have a lot of other things going on as well, such as chemical analyses of skeletal tissues to get at more subtle questions concerning individual life history differences that might be recorded in bones and teeth. And this work also provides new opportunities for research training and for students to lead still new avenues of research incorporating all these data sets. Finally, another direction that we'd like to continue in, um, we've mentioned a few cases where we've been able to identify these historical changes in the Virunga skeletons over relatively short periods of time, a matter of decades. And I think this just highlights that skeletal tissues provide a retrospective source of information about aspects of gorilla biology um, that, that allow us to ask questions that haven't previously been possible and so future studies should really explore this potential for better understanding how gorilla biology may have changed over time in this population, potentially in the face of changing threats, as well as conservation monitoring, population dynamics, and, and also climate. So to end, I just want to return to our acknowledgments. We want to thank the government of Rwanda for permission to carry out this work in Volcanoes National Park, and just reiterate that this really wouldn't be possible without the contributions of many individuals and the extraordinary efforts of staff of RDB, uh, Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, the Mountain Gorilla Veterinary Project, National Museums of Rwanda, and, and the many, many students and other researchers from academic institutions in Rwanda and the US and elsewhere, as well as our funding agencies. And to end, I just wanted to provide our contact information. Um, if anyone um, in the Zoom room today is interested in learning more about the collection you'd like to visit, or you're potentially interested in using it for your research, please, please do um, reach out. Don't hesitate to get in touch with any of us. Um, we'd be happy to give you more information and, and also give you a tour. So with that, um, thank you very much, everyone. I'm sorry, I'm realizing I went a few minutes over. No, that was really great. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, that was really, really fascinating about you know the gorillas in, in general and the value of this long-term research and recovering these skeletons. But also it's quite inspiring for um, others. Like at the center, we have this incipient collection of um, skeletons and bones. And it really gives a lot of ideas about the potential and the value of this kind of work and, and the things you can, what you can mine, get from this information. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, and I now want to uh, check the chat and uh, I not, don't see any um, questions right now. Um, oh, here we go. Let's see, it was, I popped out the chat. So um, let's see, Hillary asked, uh, by the way, um, people here, feel free to put your hand up in that little, do you all know where that little icon is by now down there? Um, no, of course I can't find it. There's a place where you can raise your hand. Um, now I'm not seeing it, but um, you can raise your hand, unmute, and ask a question, or you can put it into the chat. So Hillary, she's the first question that I can see. Um, and she's asking, is there any indication of a change in dietary components over time, such as due to forest area reduction that may, may explain decay differences? 
Um, that's a really that's a really great question. Um, so actually, decay. I, I assume you're talking about cavities or caries in the teeth. Um, that's actually something that we've not yet looked at. And um, Tade Muhire, who I, I think might be in the room today, this is something that that he and I have discussed having a look at potentially um, this year, incorporating into this larger study that he's doing of oral health in the gorillas. We do know from research um, done by um, Fossey Fund um, that there have been changes in the abundance of, of several key gorilla foods over time. And also there's some really interesting work being done now looking at dietary variability in different um, regions of Volcanoes National Park, um, not just in the Karasoki research area, but also in social groups that are monitored by RDB um, for tourism. And so I, I think we're learning a lot more about dietary variability um, over spatial scales within the park. Um, and there are probably other people in the room that can speak much more um, with much more authority and expertise regarding what we know about dietary variation over time and whether or not this has been the focus of, of substantial study. Um, but that's a really interesting question. And one of the, I mentioned one of the areas of study that we're interested in is using um, stable isotope analyses to look at the chemical composition of the enamel, the tooth enamel and dentine. Um, because then that tells us something about the chemical composition of the foods that the gorillas are consuming. And so that's another way that we can potentially mine this sort of historical record that you can see in the teeth of the gorillas, not just the ones that we know a lot about today, but especially those, those individuals in the collection that date back many decades that we know less about in terms of having behavioral records. So that is one area of potential study. That's a really interesting question. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Um, so I did um, figure out how to raise your hand. So I urge any of you to go down to the more um, at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And at more, when you click on that, you'll have a little pop-up menu. And there you can uh, click on reactions and you'll find the hands up. That way I can know that you want to ask a question and you can unmute. Um, or you can just go ahead and unmute right now. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of people trying to talk over each other. And I don't see any other questions right now in, uh, oh, there, there's another one. Oh, great. MJ is asking, is there any indication of an increase in interbirth intervals that may be correlated with an increase in conservation efforts? Um, and she's thinking about stress levels. An increase in interbirth intervals that may be correlated with an increase in conservation efforts. Um, I'm not aware of any evidence to that. Um, Winnie Eckhart did this beautiful study of, of um, variability in, in weaning and agent weaning within the Virunga population that was published just a few years ago. And she looked at different sources of variation, including the sex of the offspring and the type of social group, whether they're born into one male or multi-male social groups. Um, I can't remember now whether when he looked at age at weaning and age at weaning would be um, related to interbirth intervals um, because um, the idea being that um, an, a, 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 a female mountain gorilla, a mother, um, isn't going to invest in the next offspring until their investment in their current offspring is substantially reduced. And so you would expect that um, they would be mostly weaned, their offspring, their current offspring would be mostly weaned before they conceive the next offspring. That's a really great question, and I'm not, not sure that's been investigated, but I'm not aware of any evidence of that. But again, if there are others in the, in the chat room um, that do know the answer to that, people, I know there are people here from Fossey Fund, please do, don't hesitate to, to answer the question. Yeah, feel free to unmute. Um... That was a great question. I'm just going to keep moving forward with the questions in the chat, but feel sure. free. Um, so let's see. Um, Letizia asked, what are takeaways for those in charge of gorilla population health management besides um, other researchers proposed? I think um, this, too, this too is a really great question. Um, I think we're still at a stage where we're learning a lot about just the basic growth and 
and aging biology of this population. This is very much an area of active research. A lot of our earlier studies tended to focus on growth and development, and we're just now coming back to some of these studies of, of trauma and pathology in the skeleton. And this is something that I hope actually we can make more progress on um, this year with, with gorilla doctors. But I think sort of the first takeaway is just that there's much more to the health status of these gorillas than what we can actually observe when they're alive. And so, you know, I showed a few examples of where we see evidence of injuries in the skeleton that were not recorded in the records, were not noticed by researchers, potentially um, in Rano, for example, when he, maybe that occurred when he was a lone silverback. In other cases, we do see observations in the skeletons that I think do help us to understand a little bit more about potential cause of death factors. So in the case of Titus, who had that fracture in his and his forearm. We see a lot of evidence, we see evidence of infection affecting the bone around that fracture as well as the marrow cavity. And we know that Titus had, I believe, if I remember correctly from his vet records, um, I'm hope I'm, I hope I'm not getting him confused with another individual, but I think sepsis was one thing that was also noted in the, in the pathology reports. So in that case, I think there, there is information in those skeletons that can help us um, at best um, or or kind of at minimum provide a more holistic picture of, of, the, of the biology and health status of those individuals over their lives, but sometimes actually provide information that can be informative for cause of death. I think um, as much as we can learn now from recent members of the recent individuals in the collection, so individuals that have died recently for whom we know their individual identities, we have associated behavioral and veterinary records the more we can do now to understand how to interpret some of these lesions that we see in the skeleton in the context of well-documented veterinary records, then we just have more um, ability to look back into the past, again, at some of those unknown individuals in the collection to see what we can interpret in light of what we've learned from more recent members of the population. Yeah, thank you. Letizia, I hope that answered your question. That's a really great question about the applications of this interesting research. Let us know if that that was um, if you have other questions related to that. So we're really happy to have um, you know government and policy and management people here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then uh, Tassian, he asked, um, he, he asked about the proportion for post-mortem trauma and anti-mortem trauma. Um, okay. I guess, yeah, I guess maybe that's about sample sizes. And then also do gorilla experience current injuries from people and from human gorilla interactions? Um, okay, yeah, so I'll take those two questions in turn. So pre-mortem and post-mortem trauma. So, um, in the, the early, the, the studies that we did of the early skeletons that we recovered as of about 2011 or 2012, at that point, about 50% of the skeletons that we had in the collection showed some evidence of pre-mortem trauma. Um, Gilbert's study was a really nice um, next step towards increasing the sample by incorporating more recent individuals, uh, Gilbert Datimana, who I mentioned earlier, who I think is also with us today in the Zoom room. Um, and, and we still have more work to do to expand data collection from some of these more recently um, accumulated skeletons. So I expect that number of 50% might go down as we collect data from skeletons that have accumulated more recently. Um, the question about postmortem or perimortem trauma, what we might call perimortem trauma, which are injuries that we think occurred right around the time of death. They don't show any healing. These would be, for example, trauma associated with infanticide, which we do have quite a few examples of in the collection. Um, that is probably um, one of the more prevalent types of pre-mortem trauma injuries that we see, um, particularly for infants, of course. Um, I can't remember the percentage offhand, um, but, it, but again, I would say, you know, a, a, a significant percentage of the infants in the collection show evidence of infanticide-related trauma that occurred around the time of death. Other examples would be, we have a few cases of individuals that, that fell um, and we see fractures that probably happened around the time of death in the skeleton. 
Um, but, but mostly we're talking about trauma that occurred earlier in life or injuries that occurred earlier in life and um, which had some period of time to heal before death. And I think there was a second question that I've now forgotten. I'm sorry. Oh, no, um, those were the two from Tassian about, um, yeah, I guess you, he was asking about current injuries um, from between human and gorilla interactions. And I was thinking that was a peri um, mortem trauma, but maybe yeah. that, that was assuming they'd actually died, I guess. <laughs> so, no, I don't know. Um, but if you're looking at the bones, it would have to be. Um, so I saw there were two comments about um, this, the inner birth intervals. And Winnie mentioned that they're currently looking at the long-term changes. And thanks, Winnie. We're really looking forward to having you present that in the seminar. And Robin also mentioned um, that there has been no evidence found for changes over time um, related to the conservation efforts. But let's see. Um, an, an increase in interbirth interval with increasing rates of intergroup encounter and female transfer. Hmm. So that sounds like it's going to be a really interesting story. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, and um, so we're getting close. We, we've gone over a little bit. This is such an exciting topic, and it seemed like a lot of questions. I'm going to just do this one other question from Hillary. Um, is it known whether gorillas self-medicate by eating particular plants when in pain or having an infection that makes them feel ill? There are studies of self-medication in apes. Um, and honestly, I, I don't know the answer to this question well enough to, to speak about it in a way that I could be confident. Um, I'm not sure. Um, again, I think probably Robin or Winnie or others in the group might be able to answer this much more um, authoritatively than I can right now. I don't know if either, if anyone else wants to chime in. That's a, that's also a really great question. Um, Anybody yeah, want to try to answer? answer that in skeletons. Does anyone else have an answer to that? Oh, well, if not, um, yeah, I know that um, Jaslyn uh, from our center has been doing some literature review on that topic. And yes, of course, Michael Huffman, but there's others as well. So yeah, maybe that's another study to be done <laughs> because clearly there's injuries and illnesses happening yeah. in the mountain gorilla population. Yeah. Um, so let's see. I, I just want to give one more chance if anybody wants to unmute and make any comment before we end today. I'm being very extravagant. It's seven minutes past. <laughs> well, if not, um, I want to thank everybody. That was just really, really interesting talk. Um, who would have thought um, collecting skeletons could lead to such interesting um, findings that are both relate to theory and life histories and also conservation implications. So thanks so much to Shannon and the team. And um, we look forward to the, the seminar next week. If Vina, I think you're still here. Are you able to tell us um, what the, the seminar is next week so you can entice people to join? Yeah, the seminar next week is from 3 to 4 p.m. as usual. And we are planning to have the seminar on the mosquito. And the, this will be from Amanda Tokash Peters from one university in, in, in the United States. I don't remember the name. Oh, this is the work um, on uh, mosquito gut microbiome and wetlands quality. Yes. Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, good. Fantastic. All right, yeah. never a dull moment. So I hope everyone has a great afternoon. We're going from gorillas to mosquitoes. Can't get better than that. So um, we'll hope to see most or all of you next week and even more. And thanks again, Shannon and your group. It's really amazing research. Thank you bye all. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.